move uh, to the, our next speaker, that is Mariana Safranova from University of Delaware. Uh, she's coordinating her talk with also June Aji Agila. He's going to talk later in the day. So Mariana is going to tell us about fundamental physics with atoms and molecules. Thank you, Mariana, for, for speaking today. And thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, it's, it's really a great uh, exploration workshop and I'm very much looking forward to the talks. Can you... So as you see, fundamental physics with atoms and molecules, it's a really vast subject especially to talk about uh, half an hour. So uh, for people who are interested to learn more, uh, first there is a, a recent report, uh, Manipulating Quantum Systems. Actually, Jun Yi was a uh, co-chair of uh, this effort. And there is chapter six on precision frontier and fundamental, um, uh, fundamental nature of the universe. Uh, there is also a recent review and, uh, okay, recent has been already three years, so that's already outdated a bit uh, since there's so many new experiments. Uh, but for a very, very recent resource, uh, there is going to be a focus issue in Quantum Science and Technology Journal on quantum sensors for new physics discoveries, edited uh, together with Dima Butcher. And uh, a number of articles already accepted, but they will appear as a special issue altogether very shortly, actually. And that contains a very large number of essentially proposals for the next, what's going to happen in the next decade uh, with um, quantum sensors or fundamental physics. I've been recently asked to just summarize the entire effort on two slides for the SNOMAS effort. So I decided I'll just throw it out there. And uh, uh, there is really great many topics for fundamental physics searches with atoms and molecules. Of course, there are numerous efforts in fundamental symmetries, uh, searches with quantum science techniques. I do have a few slides on EDM, so if you're interested, I can show an end if I have time. And uh, there is searches for electron EDMs, hadronic EDMs, the parity violation. There is great many efforts with clocks. I will speak uh, partly about clocks today. And then of course, June and uh, uh, Dave will talk in much more details about clock searches, but very many new things are going to happen in the next decades with clocks. And you're going to hear, of course, in this conference more about the atom interferometry, the exon searches. There is a very new interesting efforts looking for fifth force searches with precision spectroscopy. If anyone interested in those King's plots, I can talk about that as well. And there are a great many other things which is happening. Today specifically, I will talk about clocks and how would you search for dark matter with clocks. And uh, clocks measure frequencies. So frequency is really the most precise quantity you can measure in atomic physics. And the one of the most precise quantities you can measure ever. So if uh, you want to measure something precisely, measure it in frequency. And the reason why atomic clocks are sensitive, it's because we have a very good understanding of systematics and clocks. The clocks are precise to one fraction at 10 to the uh, 18, moving the 10 to the 19 now. And uh, there is understanding of the standard model signal here. So if there is a new physics which shifts the clock frequency, it's expected that it's going to actually shift different clocks differently, especially if it's caused by some sort of relativistic effects. And in this case, you can monitor the ratio of the clock frequencies and to actually see something unusual is going on. A very brief introduction about how clocks work. Of course, June and Dave will speak more about that in detail. So essentially, you have three parts. First, you have atoms or you have an ion. And this ions, now all clocks so far, work with a single ion. Uh, that ion or atom, it's your reference. That is your standard of frequency. So then you build a laser, which is supposed to operate on pretty much exactly the same frequency as your atomic reference. So think about it, this atomic transition. You can think about it as a quantum bit, zero to one. And what that laser does, it can create the position of the zero and ones <clears throat> in a half and half uh, uh, fractions. And essentially, you shine your laser at your atom, and then you use your atoms as uh, you tune the music instrument. You change the frequency of the laser a little bit, and you see did atoms make the transition, or atoms did not make the transition, then uh, at some point you maximize the probability that the atoms are in the correct uh, final state, and that is your frequency. Then you lock your laser, 
and uh, you measure what the frequency is with optical comp. Again, the standard of frequency now is cesium. Cesium is not precise by two orders of magnitude as the present atomic clocks. But the good thing, you don't need the cesium clock to actually make any comparisons. You can directly compare the optical frequency comp to completely different clocks. So you can measure the ratio of those clock frequencies. And that's a basic idea for all the new physics searches. You can uh, <clears throat> measure the ratios of frequencies, or you can also uh, directly compare um, your clock versus your actual laser cavity. That's another possibility. Uh, there is a number of different uh, new physics searches you can pursue as clocks. It all started with looking whether the fundamental constants are constant. There is a related test of equivalence principle. If your clock moves with Earth around the sun, there is a little bit eccentricity of the orbit. And because of, because of that, you expect you can look for slightly different clock frequencies in June and July if there is any coupling to the gravitational potential. The best limits on uh, Lorentz violation is electrons, I said comparing with Torbium plus clocks, and they, uh, of course, been recent ideas of how to search for dark matter with clocks, and that's what I will talk about, and uh, also proposals to look for gravitational waves with clocks. So now, uh, the basic question here, that certain dark matter, as it had been shown by Amina Rinivatakis and Kozers and uh, follow-ups, many other papers, that it's possible that scalar dark matter and various types of dark matter can affect atomic energy levels. And the progress in clocks have been tremendous and it's expected to improve. So the question now, let's say you can actually measure changes in atomic or in the future nuclear clock frequencies. Okay, I'm going to be optimistic here, 19, 20 significant figures. We really don't know how far this rabbit hole goes at this point, there is really no technical uh, limit right now is seeing um, why clocks can't continue proving further. As you see, the improvement pretty much has been sort of more slow and uh, it is expected to continue as we'll hear uh, more. So what kind of dark matter here are we looking for? So with clocks, we are really live in those ultralight towns, beautiful slide from Andrew's long stock. And uh, uh, this clock specifically are somewhere under 10 to the minus 12 electron volts and I'll show why. First, the ultralight dark matter has to be bosonic. Uh, Fermi velocity uh, for any DM with less than about 10 electron volts is higher than galaxy escape velocity. So uh, fermionic uh, dark matter at those masses will not be binding. And the basic idea is that if you pass about one electron volt, if you're lighter than elect one electron volt, then they're no longer talking about detecting dark matter particle by particle. In your in our case, our de Broglie wavelengths of the particle is such that in one de Broglie volume, we are going to have a lot of particles. So we are talking about collective effects. Our dark matter behaves as a classical wave. It's just a cosine wave in this case. So we are talking about interaction of our whatever quantum sensor we have with essentially uh, a cosine wave. How would that affect clocks? The basic logic here is as follows. Your dark matter fields will somehow, and there are different coupling mechanisms, you can have a, a, a linear coupling, quadratic couplings, will couple, let's say it's coupled to your electromagnetic interaction, it will couple to your normal matter, say quarks, electrons, whatever you have in your quantum sensor, and that it will make fundamental complete constants and mass ratio oscillate. Uh, you will also hear later in the in this workshop about how that actually will affect atomic interferometers and how you can use those to search for dark matter. And the effect is the same. The coupling constants would oscillate if you have oscillator dark matter field. Which frequency is going to oscillate with? That's a completely different question. And uh, that will depend on the mass of your dark matter. Then uh, if that oscillates, all atomic energy levels depend on fundamental constants. Specifically for optical clocks, they depend on a fine structure constant that defines the strength of electromagnetic interaction. And the very important point that it really will matter what your clock is. So the effect will be different for say aluminum plus, which is very light strontium, strontium clock cavity, or terbium plus, or the highly charged nuclear clocks. They're going to be vast difference in how different clocks 
would actually be affected by those effects. So if you look at ratio, one clock could be essentially a background and another clock would be highly sensitive. The best case scenario that one clock have positive sensitivity, another have negative sensitivity. There is no reason why it actually all have to be positive. There is a number of clocks with negative sensitivities as well. So now, if your atomic energy level is oscillating, then your clock ratios will oscillate. So the basic idea here, well, sit and wait until, it's, uh, and uh, um, the longer you measure, the different, and this, uh, the different masses of the dark matter eventually will be sensitive to. So uh, longer measurement allows you to actually uh, increase precision because of statistics. As long as your dark matter remains coherent, it's better if you actually measure within a few coherence volumes at least. And that means that it's best if you measure for say 10 to the six and to the 10 to the eight seconds. Uh, in the theories, they can perfectly put 10 to the six seconds in the paper and they can put 10 to the eight seconds in the paper. Uh, but uh, in, uh, of course, um, connection to experiment, 10 to the six seconds, it's 11 days. 10 to the eight seconds, it's three years. So uh, measuring uh, for three years, your clock ratio every second, it's challenging. So, but on the other hand, you can sometimes, you can measure it uh, more every once in a while, but that affects which mass of your business. How does it actually work? Uh, let's say you have your normal standard model Lagrangian, that's a, a linear uh, coupling, you could, what's called dilatonic coupling. You can also have a quadratic coupling, uh, so different limit. There will be some, somewhat of a screening for the quadratic coupling, but that's, that's been treated and relatively well understood uh, uh, how to put that in. The basic idea here is that the reason why fundamental constants change is that you will have additional terms for every term in the Lagrangian to which dark matter will couple. For example, for your photon, let's say we put some coupling constant, uh, which of course will be small, or we just put it something like one over lambda uh, here, and then your dark matter field with scalar coupling directly couples to your photons. And now that means that in addition to your standard model, fundamental constant, you will have an oscillating component in here. And that what will actually lead to the oscillation uh, clock frequencies. And uh, as I said, um, just measure it for a long time. Now those K1, K2 are sensitivity coefficients for two clocks. With atoms, those can be computed very accurately. All we have to do just change alpha and our codes and you can predict it generally to like a percent level. So that really can be computed very well. For nuclear clock, that's a total different question. So anything involved with nuclear physics, uh, computational sensitivities, of course, are much less reliable. But with atoms, we know how each clock is sensitive. Even with highly charged ions, even with complicated systems, we can put it down to a few percent. How would, you, how would it work? So you, uh, let's say you're taking your measurements and let's say, uh, your clocks are perfect. Let's say there is no zero at that time for preparation. You constantly are capable of actually making measurements. Usually that involves more than one atomic ensemble uh, because it takes time to cool down and prepare your atoms uh, every once in a while. But let's say you don't worry about that. Let's say you have uh, coherent measurements. So you run your time, let's say a second with the best lasers eventually we're hoping to maybe 50, 100 seconds. And uh, now you have a time array of those measurements. So let's say you kept measuring for, well, as long as your graduate students and postdocs and I mean, uh, uh, clock can actually, um, supposedly can actually work uh, in the future, hopefully without interruption for quite some time. Let's say now you have a sequence of say a few days or if, you know, a few months. And then all you do, you need to convert your time sequence using the discrete Fourier transform into the, um, then a frequency domain. In a frequency domain, what you're going to have, it's a very specific signal. It's going to be a peak at the dark matter frequency. So you know, uh, if you see that with many clocks, that's uh, a fairly straightforward signal to actually confirm, because if you know the frequency, then you can just uh, switch from broadband to resonant and just continue measuring at that particular frequency. And the signal is going to be uh, actually somewhat misshaped because of there is a dark matter dispersion, uh, we generally assume that dark matter is not moving and we are moving at three, three, about three kilometer, 300 kilometers per second. 
But of course, there are going to be many variations which could exist on that, but that shape actually uh, just goes from the simplest one. Now, which frequencies uh, and which masses for dark matter are sensitive as clocks? So first, there are going to be a few requirements. If you do want to actually do it through the uh, Fourier transform, you need to have uh, no more than one dark matter oscillations during your oscillation time. Otherwise, you're going to be averaging over your dark matter oscillations. Of course, uh, there are uh, uh, special dynamic decoupling sequences which you can use to avoid that. So, but that involves operating with extra pi pulses beyond normal clock protocols. Now, during, during your entire measurement sequence, you should get at least one dark mode oscillation. Uh, if you don't, then you have to should fit in some sort of a, just a, a sine function instead of doing the Fourier transform. If, if that measurement, one measurement time is second, you're sensitive to uh, the best sensitivity to your dark matter would be about 10 to the minus 15. But clocks are particularly good with a very, very light dark matter masses. So the sensitivity rapidly improves if you actually go to lighter dark matter, uh, because there you acquire the more statistics. Uh, sensitivity uh, becomes less competitive if you're actually starting to go to uh, higher masses. And uh, it's probably unrealistic to go uh, to megahertz pulses because essentially your um, statistics per one measurement is going to be small or you have to apply a lot of pulses. So that's kind of for specifically clocks rather than very spectroscopy experiments. That's about uh, your um, uh, preferred mass range somewhere below 10 to the minus uh, 12. And of course, it can probe various fuzzy dark matter. Of course, I stopped at this point. That's sort of a preferred idea for the 100% dark matter. But you can probe, of course, for smaller mass. And uh, here is uh, uh, some of the latest bound from uh, Drew Lee's uh, recent Fizzer Flatters paper. And uh, here you can actually look uh, what various limits are. That is your coupling between your dark matter and uh, your uh, photons. And that's your dark matter masses. And uh, the purple, it's a microscope mission in space. The purple dash, it's a <clears throat> torsion balances experiments. And uh, then uh, those, all the previous blue and, uh, no, not the blue, sorry. Uh, the previous uh, constraints were from uh, rubidium, cesium, and dysprosium from all the tests which are not specific for the dark matter searches, but rather than just variation fundamental constants. And here are uh, new limits which have been set and the projected limits. And you will hear more uh, about those in a future talk. And also what the uh, progress with those specific type of experiments is going to be. And then uh, we come to another possibility of different dark matter type scenarios which you can actually look at. It's been suggested in 2014 to look at the uh, transient effect, uh, which the most straightforward transient effect would be the main wall. And uh, here you're looking for a different thing. Here you're looking for some sort of a large structure topological defect, which is about Earth size. And there have been about, I think, four experimental papers looking for that with different networks of clocks, for example, uh, from GPS and next of clocks. However, there's been a recent paper from Evgeny Stadnik which is essentially saying that that, is, that effect is going to be entirely screened in all the present, present in the regime of all of the previous experiments. And uh, the idea is not uh, new, it's technically known that for the quadratic, potential with quadratic interactions, you would have screening in high density environments. The important part here is that for topological defects, this is much enhanced. So screening is much more severe than that for the normal quadratic interaction. And I would love to hear more uh, what other theorists actually think about that. But the basic effect that in low density environment, that's your potential, and that's what allows you to create those topological defect structure. In the high density environment, uh, this is completely smeared by your uh, local density field. The statement from the paper that all current experiments which were looking for topological defects were in a regime of strong screening, and that was not accounted for. However, the good point here is that if such a field exists, the point Evgeny was making that it doesn't matter if you have any topological domain ever crossing Earth, that that will automatically lead to non-transient effects. And that the non-transient effects are actually much stronger than transient effects. And the reason why that works, it's because of the screening, you would have a differential potential around Earth. 
So there are going to be environmental dependence of any fundamental constants or, well, specifically clocks are sensitive to alpha and some of the others, that all you should do is actually look at differential with height. For example, the Tokyo Sky Tree experiment, that's a comparison of clocks uh, on the ground in a Tokyo Sky Tree uh, tower, it's about 400 meters, set some of the better limits and uh, for the uh, very light masses for the largest poles. And then microscope mission and uh, uh, torsion balances experiments are actually very, very good in setting limits to those transient, non-transient type effects. The important part, it doesn't matter how many domain walls are in the universe. In fact, they're going to put the one domain wall somewhere else, and that effect will still exist. So I would love to hear more uh, about uh, what other people think, but that brings us to the question, uh, what can network of clocks can detect. If you have a network of clocks, for example, the clock in Jilla, which is about, you know, more than one kilometer high, and clock in PCB, which is closer to the Earth level, of course, you can actually look for that specific differential with a high precision. But the question is, if you have a network of clocks at the same height, what kind of effect can it actually look for? And I have a specific list of questions for theorists, including this one. Uh, one other completely different uh, things, but related, uh, not to topological defects, but to the oscillating effects, is the uh, interesting idea of relaxion. So relaxion, cosmological relaxation uh, of the electroweak scale, in this case, it's a scenario which would address the gauge hierarchy uh, problem. In this case, you don't need any of the heavy particles. All you need is a light spin zero field, which would dynamically relax the Higgs. Uh, mass with respect to natural large value. Uh, we've collaborated on looking how would clocks look for such a um, type of uh, residual particle. And here between those green lines, you have sort of naturalness bounds for uh, the relaxion. As, as you can see, current experiments are somewhat far away from it, but for the, from the nuclear clock, you can actually be within the um, parameter space for the relaxion. And that's kind of interesting to continue what happens with it and uh, um, what other possible cost scenarios when you actually have a specific range can be looked for. So here uh, in the spirit of this exploratory conference, I put together a list of questions uh, for uh, theorists, which we urgently need answers to. And the, the first one is what new physics can a network of clock probe, which is single or I mean two clock uh, usual system cannot. Because right now, everything has been focused on those transient effects, but if those transient effects actually be easier problem with non-transient effects, we really need to know what the network of clocks can probe, which is different. Well, besides all this improved statistics, just having more clocks. Then important question now is NASA is interested in putting clocks to space. And of course, um, as those clocks will eventually link the Earth's network, what new physics can be probed by sending clocks to space? If clock is an elliptical orbit, one straightforward thing that you can better limits on just looking for variation of gravitational potential, uh, but it will be interesting to see for more different effects. Also, uh, what orbit do you need to actually maximize those effects? And uh, then again, the question about network of clocks. Uh, let's say we want to probe the same physics as a problem for a single clock. Is there any ideas of how to do it better having the networks? Much, much better, not just statistically better. So is there any tricks which one can actually use here? And then I think the important part, what specific dark matter candidates can clocks probe? Like relaxation, I show specifically this example when there is a parameter space. I know, I know there is a reason why relaxations have parameter space because they have to solve a specific problem. The same as axions uh, solve the strong CP problem, therefore have a parameter space. But it would be interesting to see whether there are some specific candidates like this which exists. Also, uh, if we are not looking for domain walls for transient, what other transients would we be looking for? For example, some sort of fuzzy strings, uh, some uh, whether we can actually look for uh, various monopoles. That is actually a very interesting question to ask to put a specific examples of how those transients looks like, how they're produced, can you produce them in a reasonable numbers to actually be dark matter, and how many of transients you could have, say, per year. So to put some realistic uh, um, framework under the whole transient idea, uh, because it looks like the main walls, 
if they exist, they're unlikely to be a transient. They're also unlikely to be actually cold. That's a whole different question. And then there's been a recent idea that uh, your uh, LIGA, Virga, and hopefully in future Carga gravitational wave signal would actually be accompanied by uh, additional uh, signal from ultralight fields. Uh, there is a possibility that a large number of ultralight potentially dark matter particles could be actually produced during the uh, uh, mergers. And in this case, uh, this type of signal is very different. It's highly relativistic, but it could be correlated with gravitational wave detection. And it's interesting to actually have some of the more background as uh, how the signal would look like, what's the probability that's actually happening and which type of ultralight scalar fields could actually be released in which quantities uh, and put some more really solid theoretical background for that idea. And then uh, in various uh, papers, you can see some different ideas of dark matter clustering. For example, for relaxions, uh, there's some idea that relaxion can cluster around Earth or Sun. There are experimental limits of how much dark matter you can actually tolerate within the moon orbits from laser ranging or within Earth's orbits with just uh, looking at motion of uh, uh, different objects in the solar system, but that's a pretty high bound. So the question is, can we actually expect some of the additional clustering which will help this detection? And uh, how much time do I have? Sorry, Mariana, you have until uh, 9.20. So now is uh, like five minutes more. Perfect, okay. And then I will talk a little bit uh, going from the clocks which you already have, and they have been developed for reason of metrology, to actually looking for novel systems. Uh, the first question, why would we look for novel systems? Because the first quantum sensors were built with systems which is easiest to cool and trap, have the simplest electronic structure and have stable isotopes. And that was, uh, of course, made perfect sense to do it this way. But now that we move from, we have quantum sensors and we can detect, say, dark matter with us, to the question is, which dedicated experiments, which dedicated quantum technologies we want to build, which would be the most sensitive to those effects. And uh, the reason why that's important is because in many heavy ions, atoms, molecules, you have high relativistic effects because electrons are so much closer to the nuclei. Uh, in many cases, you have for fundamental symmetries, you have Z-cubed or more scaling, you can deform nuclei, you have large effective fields for fundamental symmetry testings. And in terms of clocks, you just have different types of transitions available. For example, uh, you can look for different fundamental constants, uh, or uh, also you have much, much higher sensitivities. So new systems uh, could have different properties which allows reduced systematics or just be more sensitive. In the context of clocks, there are two specific proposals. Uh, there are, of course, you can look for different um, transitions in uh, neutrals or singly charged, but you can also look for the highly charged ions. And for the highly charged ion, you take a neutral atom and you just tear electrons and continue tearing electrons until you get a useful thing. And here we are talking about uh, generally relatively not very highly charged ions. Here is an example of argon-13 plus with which current experiments have been done. So you strip 13 electrons. And uh, here you end up with a fine structure, hyperfine structure, or some level crossing transition optical range. So generally those things were not looked at before because first uh, those were completely different types of technologies. And second, because generally all of those transitions were considered being uh, far outside of the useful uh, range of lasers, this is no longer the case. In both of those cases, uh, the experimental proof already exists that you can do it, and uh, you actually have a lot of optical transitions. And here you have both reduced systematics and much higher sensitivity to new physics. And uh, there have been the first demonstration of sympathetic cooling of highly charged ion. Why that important? Because to build a clock, you're saying your atom needs to be trapped. It needs to be very cold. And previously, uh, there were no cold highly charged ions, and that had been uh, remedied. And uh, in just five years, there have been demonstration of coherent laser spectroscopy uh, um, with sympathetic with quantum logic spectroscopy in highly charged ions. And the reason why such a system is used is because with highly charged ions, you need to have another ion to actually uh, talk to your highly charged ion. You need a different ion on which you can do spectroscopy and they will be sitting in the same trap uh, connected 
actually through a strong Coulomb coupling. And I assume they uh, Hume would actually give talk more about quantum logic spectroscopy. And uh, in remarkable triumph in a single experiment, just because those ions were now ultra cold, the relative accuracy of any frequency measurement and highly charged ions improved from about 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus 15. So that's what having your system cold gets you, seven orders of magnitude precision because your system is now ultra cold. So now uh, those are wonderful resources that I expect to have a rapid progress with highly charged ions. They have much higher sensitivity to the variation of alpha. So present clocks generally have those key factors less than one. Ultra beam uh, plus has actually, it's a minus six. And then about highly charged ions have enhancement factors more than a hundred uh, for the combination of ions. You also have sensitivity to electron mass to the proton mass ratio and the quark mass to lambda QCD ratio variation additional enhancements to Lorentz violation searches. We recently reviewed all of those proposals uh, and look for systematics in highly charged ions. And uh, honestly, I think they're going to be rapid progress here. Uh, also, also um, you can actually use highly charged ions to look for those precision measurements uh, of isotope shifts, to look for the FIPS forces. So expected the selected HCIs in five years, uh, according to Pete Schmidt, would uh, read, reach about um, 10 to the minus 18 accuracy, and hopefully in 10 years we actually have clocks with strong alpha sensitive transitions at this accuracy in multi HCI clocks. And then you can ask why atomic transitions, why not nuclear transitions? Because well, I mean there are transitions in nuclei, so why don't you use those for actually your uh, test for alpha variation. And basic idea because they're way outside of the laser range, at least the tabletop lasers. There is, uh, if you look here, those red things are atomic transitions in frequency and you're looking for somewhere like a few EV energies and mostly those are key EV to M EV. There is a one exception, there is a thorium to 29 nucleus, which uh, by a chance of nature has the laser accessible transition. And uh, that is transition between the ground state and isomer. It's expected to be very, very narrow. Its uh, frequency uh, has determined around to about two significant figures, but uh, it's expected that that can be laser excited and I expect that it'll be laser excited relatively soon. But the reason why they're so interested in it, it's because your difference in the Coulomb energy scales between those two levels are somewhat like MEV scale because your entire uh, binding energy is a GEV scale. And therefore you're looking at enhancement of alpha variation of like eight EV to the MEV effect. So instead of having the maximum sensitivity factor of any current operating clock is six, that is 10 to the five. Also that actually will couple to the uh, nuclei as well. Uh, in this case, you can actually look for the coupling of the nuclear uh, of your dark matter to the nuclear sector. I see a comment, is there a comment in chat? Okay, and yes, I'm finishing. I'm going not, uh, I have prepared some talks about the EDM. So I'm going to, if anyone interested, then I can talk about the EDMs. And I would like to thank a uh, group on of Delaware and our collaborators and many thanks to a number of people for the input for this talk. Thank you so much for your attention. Oh. Thank you very much, Mariana, for the very exciting talk. Um, so we are now open for questions. And then after that, we can we have like 10 minutes of questions for Mariana's talk. And then we can enter an all uh, panel when all participants, uh, we can discuss about the two the talks in the morning. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, Lance, go ahead. I just kind of a naive question. Thanks a lot for that talk. I'm just curious about the status of clocks in space. You know, I, I think there must have been some <laughs> clocks in space, but how how much less accurate are they, and and uh, what sort of proposals are there uh, for the future? Well, uh, of course you have GPS, but GPS you are looking about ten nanoseconds. Uh, the good thing about GPS is that it's large. So, I mean, this is 50,000 kilometers uh, for those transient effects. It's relatively competitive with clock on Earth. It is a 6,000 kilometers, but uh, mostly the clock networks on Earth already would be better. So there is a proposal uh, and uh, I know NASA exploring of ideas of sending better clocks to space. Uh, 
I, I think my Sri Lanka colleagues could probably come in better uh, regarding what, uh, what clocks, uh, <clears throat> uh, what other clocks are present now, but sending 10 to the minus 18 clock to space is going to be for now difficult because just a lot of compactness, but I think sending, um, you know, uh, there is many efforts in miniaturization. So you can put the uh, trap time clocks in relatively small, small packages. So uh, there is much effort in portable clock, but portable has been put on a track rather than put on a, a, a rack to go to space. Uh, I'm hesitating to put specific number. I don't know if uh, June and Dave, I don't know if there is Dave Lambrand in the audience or uh, Dave Hume. Um, yeah, I, uh, I can chime in a little bit. You're exactly right. There are several efforts around the world to miniaturize and make these optical clocks more robust. So um, there are efforts here in the U.S., in the European Union, in China. And for portable clocks, they are targeting this level of 10 to the minus 18. Um, and, you know, that'll be useful for a number of different things. Um, one of those is just comparing clocks between continents, which we, we don't have a way right now of uh, sending the stable signals across intercontinental distances. Um, the, you know, space clocks um, are ambitious. Uh, there are ambitious proposals. People are definitely imagining uh, getting 10 to the minus 18 level uh, clock accuracy also in space, uh, but that's not uh, next year kind of thing. Thank you, Dave. Great. Uh, I don't see at the moment. Oh, yes. Anupan, go ahead. So, uh, Mariana, thanks for a very interesting talk. And so I just have a very um, naive question. So suppose you send the clock to in, in space, would you also have to take into account of the gravity, gravity gradient noises and things like that? Uh, yes, in fact, actually, uh, at the present time, at 10 to the minus 18, you're sensitive to uh, about a centimeter. So uh, of, of, the, of, of the height. So yes, uh, and that's actually so, one of the proposals. I could, uh, I could hear the last bit, could you? Okay, so uh, with about 10 to the minus 18 precision right now on Earth, you're sensitive to change uh, at about uh, a centimeter-ish level. So uh, you can detect the difference in height yeah. uh, at the level of, uh, of order of centimeters. Now, uh, and that's actually one of the ideas that that's what clocks in space can do, the test of general relativity. So uh, yes, that actually uh, sort of you can turn it around and, and see how that would work. And that's one of the applications for clocks actually for gravimetry, so uh, what's called relativistic geodesy. Uh, and uh, I've, I've talked to geodesists and they eagerly await those portable clocks, which you can put in different points uh, and essentially look at the earth changing in real time. So that is one of the possibilities actually to actually look at the general relativity. Is there any uh, uh, possibility to send a clock, say, for instance, either atomic clock in LISA? Because uh, that's another way we can perhaps... Well, uh, I, I, there will be more talks by uh, um, Jason uh, Hogan and Peter Graham, uh, actually looking at atomic nephrometry. And as you can see, those atomic nephrometers, they are kind of, they are pretty much from the same strontium systems the clocks are. So uh, here you're looking at a, uh, a hybrid and uh, the, the that you're looking at the ferromagnetic scheme uh, with a clock-like system. So uh, presumably you will need some clocks for synchronization as well. And I'm, I'm sure you hear the details, but yes, you could in principle actually use clocks directly to look for gravitational wave. And they have been a proposal how to do that. So with, uh, with ultra, -precise, ultra precise clocks. Thanks, thank you. Great. So maybe I, I will ask one question, Mariana. So uh, when you look at, I mean, if, if you want really to detect um, dark matter, for example, because there are other, uh, following what Anupan was saying, I mean, dipole-dipole interactions, even contact interactions, some tuning effects. So what would be the specific trend that you have to say how it would depend on uh, oh, oh, sorry, June, I didn't see it. So let me finish and I will jump with you. My apologies. Um, just, or do you want to start talking? It was about the, the, the question before, June? 
Um, maybe no, I can. Maria, no, please go go ahead. It's, it's... Okay, I, I will do very short and, and then please, and I'm sorry, I don't know why I didn't see. Um, so, so Maria, just very quickly, Marianne, if, if you want to really claim that is dark matter, what would be, what would, be, what you have to compare? What are the changes that you have to do to say is dark matter and not something else? Or do you have to compare between different isotopes? What, what would be the requirement? So first, uh, we all phrase this in terms of searching for dark matter, but let's, let's make it straight. We are looking for some unknown particles here. So whether that particle is 100% dark matter, partially contributing to dark matter, uh, that's uh, a different question. Now, uh, there is, so there are certain effects which you can actually separate. For example, Lorentz invariance uh, very, uh, variolation, you can separate out because that will be a sidereal. You actually have a different um, dependence of uh, uh, with Earth rotation and with Earth rotating around the sun. So Lorentz violation, you can separate from oscillating effect. You can separate oscillating effect from transients. So uh, with, um, however, what you will get, uh, let's say you have a positive signal detection that's blocked for oscillating effect. Uh, you will be able, presumably, distinguish between uh, linear and quadratic coupling. You could, and you will know, you can, if you have a nuclear clock, you can actually see whether you have couplings to the nuclear sector to just and for that, you or the electrons. How do you distinguish because of the rate of the frequency? How do you distinguish right. between so certain, Right. So uh, you can actually look for the limits. And for example, you can see something in the nuclear sector with a nuclear clock, but you will not see anything in the uh, photon sector, or you'll not see anything electron sector. So you'll know which part of the dark, at least what's the strongest coupling to the standard model. Or if you actually see as uh, a signal in uh, optical clocks, then it has to couple to photons. So your dark matter have to couple to photons. So you will know the coupling and you will know the mass. So and in this case, you can actually switch from the, all, all the detection I show is broadband, but there are methods for resonant detection. So you can actually start looking at these different clocks and you can also start looking at the deferometer. Uh, but in this case, uh, <clears throat> the question, can you, I think that knowing the mass and knowing the coupling, you can tell how much total you will have. So whether it, which person, I would, theorists can correct me, but I think you can actually tell which, can it be 100% dark matter or not? So, uh, because you will have to know how it couples. Uh, it's an interesting question whether you can actually determine of how, mu how much it will contribute to the dark matter density total. Because generally we assume that as all those graphs, I assume it's 100% dark matter. Because somewhere in there, you have to put dark matter density uh, in your computation to actually get those graphs. So in this case, it, if you do see the signal, that would assume 100% density that it could be dark matter. For the other effects, uh, you could actually see some variation. If you see just some variation uh, with the um, uh, gravitational potential, then somehow it has to couple through this uh, type. And that will give you some additional information. But mostly, you ha we have a number of other instruments besides clock which can look for similar effects. And then you can, of course, start looking through uh, uh, different possibilities. But that's already a lot of information. The coupling, uh, coupling, and the mass, and the total, uh, uh, I guess, total, uh, um, whether it can actually be dark matter or not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. So, uh, June, please go ahead. Thank you, Anna Maria. I was just going to add a comment to what Mariana was being asked and answering. There are a lot of uh, interest of, of uh, launching the clock in space. Dave already mentioned, uh, you know, the activities going on at 10 to minus 18 level of people are building portable clocks. But Andrew Pope Pam's question actually prompted me to also emphasize another really important point, which is, and that's actually really the, the exciting aspect of why clock is so important. The clock is gonna be very sensitive to the local space time. And so if you launch there, you have actually act, the, this transfer, clock transfer synchronization task, is gonna be tremendously important. When the satellites are zipping by, you have to consider both, you know, velocity effect and the gravitational field effect. And all of these have to be carefully tracked uh, to be able to actually compare clock to the level of 10 minus 18 and beyond. So that lies both in terms of technical challenges, uh, building up these networks of clocks and connecting them and in a way that you can compare them at this level. 
but also you can see there's a tremendous potential for discovering anomalies, discovering, uh, you know, discovering new physics and so on. Uh, and in terms of if we can put a clock on LISA pathfinder, yeah, that would be super exciting. But if you want to turn clock into gravitational wave detection, we are talking about, you know, 10 to minus 21 level of clocks, which does not exist today. But we are making rapid progress towards it. Uh, you know, uh, very recently we started to get into 10 minus 20. Uh, so it's maybe in the next 10 years you will have those clocks. But in terms of putting them in space, it will take a while to for technological maturation and so on. So probably won't be uh, able to have clocks at the level of 10 to minus 19, 10 to minus 20 in the next 10, 20 years to be in space. Actually, uh, just a comment. But we have to, that does not mean that we should not pursue it. You know, and if just being able to start to put the networks up there to be able to support Tandemus 18, that's how we get started. Great, perfect. 